Mm -hmm. oh, we're starting to get up some people log in. Welcome everyone who's, who's logged in for the Dare to Lead book discussion tonight. Please, as a reminder, um, if you can mute your microphones as you come online, that would be very helpful just to, um, just to handle any background noise, um, just from a record keeping standpoint, that would be great. And once again, my name is Mike Daso. I'm the chair of the education committee um, for the Lakewood Chamber of Commerce. And um, welcome tonight. I think um, we're, we're gonna give at least three or four minutes to allow all the participants to log on to the discussion. And I'll direct you towards the bottom of the screen after you mute yourselves. Uh, there's a, there should be a chat bubble at the bottom of the screen. I don't know if one of the panelists maybe can do a test um, chat for me there saying hello to everyone. That would be great. Uh, just to make sure that, that that pops up for me. And um, if you have any questions that, that come up as we're going through the, oh good, I got all, I got Lauren and uh, Emma and Jeanette posted to the chat. Hopefully everyone logging on can see that chat as well. So if any ideas or questions come up as we're going through the panel discussion, feel free to add it to the chat dialog box. There'll be uh, a portion at the end of the discussion where we can either ask some of those questions that have been submitted to the chat box, or even if a thought comes up as we're going through the panel discussion, it would be helpful to add it to the chat and we'll try to interject it if it's appropriate during the, uh, during the panel discussion as well. Um, it, feel free to say hi on the chat now so I can see at least some of the an attendees can get through and chat. Um, so I'm, I guess I'm giving a call out, shout out now to any of the attendees. Uh, oh good, I got at least one, thank you Bill. Bill DeBassi, I just chimed in. Uh, thank you um, to everyone else um, chiming in seeing that that's working as well. I think that's gonna be the best way to add and give input to the discussion uh, tonight. Um, we're gonna give it probably two more minutes uh, before we get started. So if you can uh, just bear with us a minute, a minute or two longer, and then we'll go ahead and get started and do some introductions and then start with, uh, with the book discussion part. Um, actually, before we do formal introductions, we, we went through a, uh, I guess you'd call it a, a dry run a little bit earlier, and I just want to give all the panelists a heads up. I've, I've personally, I can't ever remember doing a book club um, or a book discussion. Um, I'm going to be the moderator this evening, but I'd just be curious, and we'll get feedback after they do their introductions, um, whether any of the panelists have ever done a book club before. Um, I did read a, uh, or I pulled an article from the Huffington Post um, in preparation for this. That just gives a couple of ideas in terms of why people do book clubs. And uh, number one reason is to meet interesting people. So certainly even though we're doing it virtually, um, it is definitely a way to meet new people. Uh, bullet point number two was you read things you wouldn't otherwise read. And I tend to be a nonfiction reader anyways, um, and I like uh, this, these types of books, but um, it actually got me thinking, it might be interesting to, to do a book club, and, and if a book was chosen for me, it might be something that I might not read on a regular basis. So that's certainly another reason to consider doing book clubs. Number three, and I think this is really why we're doing this tonight, is it said some books just need to be discussed. And I think some of the topics and conversation that we'll be talking about tonight in terms of the Dare to Lead um, are, are really some important topics. Number four, it says you eat great food. Well, I don't know if anyone at, at home is, is enjoying their favorite beverage or eating, eating some food in front of their computer screen. Feel free to chime in on the chat if you wanna share your favorite beverage for the other people out there and what you might be enjoying this evening. Um, I know Patty Ryan, um, showed us her koozie and beer a little bit earlier when she created the login. So um, feel free to, to enjoy and partake at home and, um, and share that. The event was supposed to be down at Clifton Beach and we had the beach house reserved. And about 
two uh, weeks ago, they contacted me and, and did indeed confirm that uh, they were unable to host because of the 10 person limit down at Clifton Beach. Uh, oh, good. I've seen someone's having tea, uh, Baskin Robbins. All of that sounds very good. So the panel are the uh, chats coming through, which is uh, very helpful. Uh, we're going to get started in just uh, about 30 seconds. Um, and we'll go straight into the panel discussion. Okay. So with that, let's go ahead and get started. So once again, my name is Mike Daso. I'm on the board of directors for the Lakewood Chamber of Commerce. And I'm really just here to moderate our panel discussion this evening. We have three panelists that are also on the Education Task Force, which is one of the committees of the uh, Lakewood Chamber of Commerce. And um, the panelists are Emma Petrie Barcelona. She's president of Lakewood City Schools Board of Education. And she, when she does her introduction, she'll tell you a little bit about her day job as well. And then we also have Allison Urbanic, who's the Housing and Internal Operations Director for Lakewood Alive. And then we also have Jeanette Berger, and she's the Director of the University of Akron Lakewood. Um, so with that as an overview, I would like to uh, turn it over to Emma and have her give a, a brief uh, introduction. Great, thank you. Good evening, everybody. Uh, yes, I'm Emma Petrie Barcelona. I've been serving Lakewood now in my ninth year on the Lakewood Board of Education. I'm currently president. And in context of this book, I do serve uh, with four other people. And so we're, we're part of a group and a team that, that works through uh, policies. And in the Lakewood City Schools and, and in any district, we have two employees and those employees are the superintendent and the treasurer. So uh, we don't have everybody as employees there. Uh, during the day, um, I am the, well, I guess all the time, but <laughs> primarily during the day, I'm the Director of Compliance for Eden Inc. Eden is a, an affordable housing nonprofit, and we do have two major areas of business. The first is that we own or manage um, a, a, about almost a thousand units of affordable housing throughout primarily Cuyahoga County, but we do have some units outside of Cuyahoga County in the state of Ohio. And we also uh, manage a couple thousand uh, rental subsidies for uh, for people who are uh, people with disabilities, people who are formerly homeless, and other special needs populations. And those subsidies are are in units all over Cuyahoga County. Um, my background overall is um, working primarily with people and programs that serve low and moderate income people and places. And so before this, I worked for other nonprofits. I've had, uh, I worked for the city of Lakewood for a couple of years. I've worked for the Federal Reserve Bank of Cleveland. Um, but in my role right now, I actually do direct a team. There's my department's three people, including me. So I have two employees and I'm part of the leader, leadership team of our nonprofit. So I look forward to the discussion today. Oh, I guess I should note too. Uh, another I job I have is I am married and I do have two, two students here in the Lakewood city schools. <laughs> Thank you very much, Emma. Um, Allison, if you want to give an introduction next. Good evening, and thank you so much for inviting me to be on this panel. I'm very excited to discuss the book, uh, Dare to Lead. Uh, so uh, as uh, Mike mentioned, I am the Housing and Internal Operations Director for Lakewood Alive. Lakewood Alive is a community uh, nonprofit focused on fostering and sustaining vibrant neighborhoods. My role there is to uh, oversee the housing outreach program, uh, and our program has a mission of uh, ensuring that all Lakewood residents live in healthy and safe housing. I also work as part of the leadership team. Uh, Lakewood Alive uh, has seven staff members and I oversee um, roughly five of those people on and off uh, or in a shared capacity. I work very closely with our board of directors uh, and I'm also on the board of a um, grant making organization, the Three Arches Foundation. Uh, I came into leadership somewhat early in my career uh, about probably three years into my career, I kind of landed into a leadership position and I didn't receive any proper training. And I really tried my best to figure out how to work best with people. And that has been the best training that I think or advice that I received was really listening to my colleagues and my coworkers and seeing what they need in order to be successful. And that has helped me to develop my uh, leadership skills throughout the years. 
Uh, I have now been working in a nonprofit field for um, 15 years, which is scary to say. 15 years. This year is my 15-year uh, college reunion. Um, that's supposed to be happening actually this weekend. Um, but uh, so I'm excited. Yeah. I, I'm excited to be part of this discussion. I'm excited, uh, as I mentioned, to be part of the Lakewood Alive Leadership Team. And I look forward to the questions and working with others. Um, I guess I also want to mention that I uh, am a proud um, owner of three dogs here in Lakewood. And I have a husband. Uh, and we enjoy being part of this great community. Thank you very much, Allison. And finally, Jeanette, um, also want to give uh, University of Akron Lakewood a, a big thank you for sponsoring this panel discussion uh, this evening. Um, so in addition to your introduction, Jeanette, if you can touch a little bit on the University of Akron Lakewood, that would be great as well. I don't know if Patty, if you wanna go back at maybe following her introduction back to the slide while she talks a little bit further about the University of Akron, that would be great. Thanks, Mike. It is a pleasure to sponsor this event on behalf of the University of Akron Lakewood. It's a pleasure to be here tonight on the panel. Um, so I have actually worked for the University of Akron in one capacity or another for 17 years. Um, have worked in different offices, including orientation, academic advising, uh, student services, and now administration um, at the University of Akron Lakewood. Um, and every every position that I've had, it obviously is working with students, um, and they are uh, a fantastic organization within themselves um, and very unique. So um, as I was reading this book, I kept getting ideas for how I could implement things into um, working with students directly or other administrators or there's infinite possibilities. Um, a little bit more about me. I graduated from the university with both my bachelor's and master's degrees. Um, and in my spare time, I enjoy volunteering um, I work with a foundation that presents mental health awareness presentations to collegiate undergraduates throughout North America, actually. Um, and then also I am in a theology leadership program and try to do travel and missionary service work um, when I can get away as well. So um, again, I'm thinking about all these different organizational implications that I can apply the things that we're going to talk about tonight um, to all of those different organizations. Um, a little bit about the University of Akron Lakewood. If you did not know, we are in Lakewood High School currently, um, hoping to move over to the Taft Center for Innovation, Innovation uh, this summer, along with the board. And um, the University of Akron Lakewood is part of the regional academic centers for the University of Akron. We also have a campus in Medina as well as Orville. Um, our current programs include the Master of Social Work, the Bachelor of Social Work, we also have a cohort in uh, master's level teaching English as a second language and a bachelor's degree called organizational supervision. Um, so we do offer a lot of um, support through the high school as well in our College Credit Plus program. We offer the intro to psych and social psychology with Dr. G if you're familiar with him. Um, and so we're just excited to be in Lakewood and we're excited to be here tonight, so. Thank you very much. Uh, so we're going to go ahead and get started just to let all, all, all the participants know from a formatting standpoint. So I have a couple of questions that I'll use as primers to uh, get the discussion going with the three panelists. And we had assumed that that would probably start around 7.15, so it looks like we're right about on time for that. And then the panel discussion should go for about 25 to 30 minutes. So our plan would be to have the formal plan, panel discussion um, finishing up around 7.45. And then our goal is to be done uh, within an hour, so around 8 o'clock. Um, as I mentioned before, if you have any thoughts or comments as we're going through the topics, uh, feel free to add them to the chat. And then um, as we get closer to 7.45, I'll prompt you again if you have any other questions or discussion items that you would like to ask any of the panelists or just throw out for general discussion, please add that to the chat as well as we go along. Um, so I think I'd like to start out by asking each of the panelists, I think really the core of the book is that oftentimes it's, it's difficult to have tough conversations. And oftentimes we struggle or avoid 
tough conversations, um, which could include giving or receiving honest feedback. And so I'd like you each to talk a little bit about in the past, have you ever struggled or do you have any instances that you can recall where you did try to avoid tough conversations? Um, so why don't we, uh, since Emma did the first intro, why don't we start with Allison, if that would be okay with this question and see what you might have to say, say about that. Sure, so tough conversations are just that, tough conversations. And I think just with anything that we don't like to do, we tend to drag our feet on those things and make them something that isn't on the top of our, our list. And um, I think with me, especially knowing maybe that a coworker is maybe not meeting expectations or maybe if I feel like I failed someone uh, in a scenario, I'm trying to figure out the way to approach that conversation is difficult. Um, by reading this book about daring to lead, I, I appreciated the fact that it's normal, uh, that everyone's feeling that way, uh, and that, um, you know, thinking through and using um, vulnerable words, you know, allowing yourself to be honest and open and emotional with your conversation is acceptable. And I think we'll talk a little bit later, but learning to have emotions and that they're okay. I think a lot of us have been raised, especially in our professional world, that emotion is not acceptable, especially being a female. If you have emotions, uh, that's a big no-no in the, the professional world. Um, so I appreciated the fact that Brene made things approachable, digestible, and normalized. Um, having a difficult conversation, I think, is just not something that anyone wants to do, but again, I, something that really stuck with me was clear is kind and unclear is unkind. I will probably talk about that often uh, throughout this discussion tonight. But if I failed in communicating, I want to own that. Uh, that was not fair. Or if someone failed in communicating with me, um, I need them to own that too so that we can paint it done, as her terminology comes across in the book, and really kind of try to flesh out our goals and get to a common um, end game. But I think that we can all agree that once we get that conversation up and out and talk about those things that were difficult, everyone feels much better. And that's how you then figure out how to move forward. I think she calls it a vulnerable rumble or rumble with vulnerability. Um, I've learned a lot of terminology in this book that I didn't realize was a thing. So I'm looking forward to perhaps adding some of it to my dialogue. Uh, but uh, basically, I appreciate it again, the normalcy of uncomfortableness in the workplace. Yeah, so it sounds like you, uh, me, me included, I've had times where it's just, it's, it's difficult. You don't want to, I think it's the conflict. I think a lot of people are worried about conflict and it's, it's difficult if there's potentially conflict. So expectations need to be talked about and set up, set up from the beginning so that it isn't viewed as conflict. It's viewed as uh, meaningful and, and beneficial. Um, Jeanette, anything you would like to add to maybe your past and avoiding tough conversations? Yeah, sure. Um, so in the book, Brené talks about um, honesty being the best policy. And I have always considered myself a very honest and almost too blunt kind of person. Um, and that can definitely rub people the wrong way in organizations. Um, but she did frame it with honesty that's motivated by shame or anger or fear or hurt. It's not honesty. Um, it's just shame, anger, fear, or hurt masking or disguised as honesty. Um, so I think this book has really um, helped me take kind of a pause and take an inventory of exactly how am I feeling? And if it's not just honesty for the sake of honesty, um, then maybe taking a step back and really reevaluating the communication that I'm, what I'm doing. So um, oftentimes I think that uh, if I struggled with tough, tough conversations, it was one of the emotions masking as honesty, so. Meaning that you were, so were you telling people up front that, you know, I, I'm sorry, I just tend to be blunt? Was that almost like a, an excuse you were given? Is that, that's what it sounds like. And, and yeah, maybe I think more about that. Yeah, I think so. I think that um, well, anger can be a lot of feelings too, like dis like a lot of feelings disguised as anger. Um, and so, where you want to come off as like uh, honesty out of love or out of caring, I care about our working relationship, so I'm telling you my thoughts and my feelings and my ideas. 
um, or feedback about your performance if it's that situation. Um, if it's one of those underlying masking feelings, it's not going to come off as uh, this person cares about me. And I think that is often it was just kind of like a bulldozer of honesty going through. So, sure, sure. Emma, would you mind chiming in a little bit on and maybe some of your past prior to reading the book, and and how the book might change your perception on having some tough conversations? Well, sure. I mean, I think the book really sort of, I guess, reinforced and uh, some circumstances that resonated with me was where, um, in particular with say calls or emails, it's, it's being prepared to respond, especially when you know somebody is upset or angry or has a lot of things to tell you. And so I think where I consider I've had better success in those areas is where I I did take the time. Now, she does note the whole dragging your feet maybe too far. And I, I will say, I think in the past, for sure, there was probably some times I delayed something too long. But there is sort of that happy moment where it, it needs to get done, but you need to be prepared to do it. And so just sort of speaking, um, just all of a sudden or out of turn sometimes doesn't end up with the results that you want. So I think the, the concept there is is taking the time to be thoughtful about the conversation, but then not delaying it any further than it has to, you know, that it just has to happen. Um, Jeanette, you brought up one thing that really resonated with me here was, was just um, conversations in particular with regard to performance evaluations. I think often in the workplace and then working with each other, that's, that's a very um, artificial and very strange way where you, you, for the most part, talk about wonderful and good things to reinforce those good things. And yet simultaneously, you need to bring in some other things. And, and when it comes down to it, everybody, as she notes, reacts differently. And so being able to adjust, I think that this book is teaching me some techniques or ideas on how to adjust how I might even deliver the same pieces of information, but in a, in a way that will be heard that's still honest and truthful, but in, in the right ways. Um, but at the same time to not, not avoid saying something, lest it be like you mentioned, Allison, the, you know, avoiding it so much or being so obtuse or so abstract about what I'm trying to convey that whoever I'm speaking to just isn't picking up what I'm doing. So it does, it does a disservice to everybody in that regard. Sure, it can be a challenge. Um, it, it's interesting, you're, you're talking about responding to email or text. And I think some of maybe the elephant in the room right now is we're actually in a situation where we were going to have this conversation all in one room in a very informal setting down on Lake Erie. And, and I don't want it to go off completely in this direction, but maybe we should just talk a little bit about the unique challenges with what's going on with, with COVID-19 right now and the fact that a lot of the communication that we're limited to is email and texts, and we're not able to communicate in person, and there's, there's maybe something lost there. And, and I don't know if any of you have ideas on, on ways where you can try to get through that over the next, whether it's one month or six months or a year before we're able to have more in-person meetings again. Um, but I think, I think there's a challenge there too. But, so, but maybe before we get into a couple of our other questions, um, if anyone wants to jump in and just talk about that a little bit. Well, I think one thing that comes to mind here, and, and she mentions this a lot in the book with communication, is, the, is being able to trust each other with that, that truth or that honesty. Um, but that trust is so critical. And I think that is one thing I've really struggled with with this online or um, out of office environment where we're still, everybody's still working together and still um, meeting together. Heck, uh, the, maybe some of you have observed, uh, board meetings now have been remote where we all join each other on the same Zoom and the public can watch. But, um, but ultimately when, you, when you're not in the same place, sometimes it is so hard to see through uh, reactions, how people are feeling, um, and then recalibrate or, or, or do something a little different or react differently. And so that combination of trust and communication, I think, has been really challenging. I just read something, in fact, that um, I think it was either psychologists or psychiatrists or people in professional um, domains who've been using things like Zoom and others for, um, for uh, medical purposes 
that one thing they're losing a lot is that you can hear each other, but you can't see hands and, and hands and other body language is so critical in, in just communicating and, and, and trying to understand, especially for the unsaid things. Um, yeah. And that's just a lot harder now. So when I, when I combine that concept with, with trust, it just makes it a lot harder to just process and, and communicate and then ultimately trust what's happening and, and going from there. Yeah, we're getting one comment on the chat line too, and I agree with this. Uh, sometimes the answer is picking up the phone. I mean, if we don't have the sense of in person, I do think something, I think it was Karen Wagner who just posted on the chat. If you can at least pick up the phone and talk to someone, at least you're adding that element of the voice and the, the hearing that I think, I, I hear this often that something can get lost in translation with a text or with an email and it's hard to really read everything. So at least by doing a phone conversation, you're adding one more element of, of helping to communicate. Um, so I think that's an interesting comment from from someone on the chat, and I agree with that. Allison? Sure, if I could just add, I think, um, and it kind of fits in this into the book, uh, that we need to keep checking in with our staff and seeing how they're doing, uh, communicate with them, check on their emotional well-being, but also their exhaustion levels. So on top of all of this, you know, we're trying to get work done. Uh, everything takes 10 more steps than it normally would. and one day sometimes feels like a week. I don't know about anyone else, but uh, the day is just are seeming a little bit longer than they normally would because we are adding step after step just to communicate. So while there are times we need to pick up the phone to have important conversations, which I wholeheartedly agree with, uh, we also need to chat if we just need a simple question answer that we would pop next door and ask our office mate about. Uh, but exhaustion is real. So I think it's really important for us to connect with our staff. So at Lakewood Alive, we have five, two staff meetings a week via a video conference. And then if we have any check-ins with our staff, we do those generally during video conference so that we can see them and we can interact with each other um, and just get a look, of, look at them and see their beautiful faces. Uh, but then also just try to trap some sense of normal normalcy so we can see one another uh, and communicate. So I just encourage everyone to check in, uh, just especially during these trying times because it's exhausting. Yeah, a quick text could go a long way just to let someone know that you're thinking about them. So, so I agree with that, Allison. That's a good point. Jeanette, anything you wanted to add given the, the current situation we're in with, with staying at home to be safe? Right. Um, I mean, it's just a weird time for everyone where we're trying to adjust to the new communication patterns. Um, I think uh, what Allison said before, and we'll probably repeat again, is that clear is kind and un uh, unclear is unkind. And if you can just be clear in your motivation for what you're communicating and um, I think that, again, that usually will come over either by Zoom or another face-to-face -face, uh, webinar type or through the phone. It's probably not going to be reflected, most likely, in an email or a text. So, yeah. Thank you. Um, well, I want to move on. Thank you for sharing a little extra. I know that was off script a little bit on what's going on with with COVID-19 and the difficulty in communicating, but I'm, I'm glad that we talked a little bit about that as well. Um, so there's a large section in the book where, where Brene talks about armored responses um, versus leadership and daring responses. And I know there's a number of different armored responses. And I'm just, I'm curious if each one of the panelists had one where that was most difficult for them uh, I know personally, when I was reading through them, there was one where there's an, the armored response is being a knower and always needing to be right. And, and that's, a, a, I know as I was reading, I said, that's a problem that I have sometimes is this desire to always be right. And, and my wife always picks up on it. She's always there saying, hey, Mike, you don't always have to be right. If you don't know the answer, it's okay to say you don't know the answer. And that's a very important lesson. Um, so, so why don't we start, um, Emma, maybe if you want to start, uh, just give us a, a little feedback on which one of the armored responses uh, maybe you personally thought you might have uh, the most difficulty with, and we'll, we'll 
delve into that a little further. Yeah, I mean, it, indeed, I think, I think they all can resonate with us at different moments. And certainly as we move through our careers, I think we likely have almost all of them all the time as we're sort of learning and growing. But for sure, um, the one that really stuck out to me was this one that is the rewarding exhaustion, exhaustion as a status symbol and attaching productivity to self, self-worth, which is, um, I, I guess I just would, would note, I do think sometimes that's um, uh, a woman thing too, where maybe we do uh, take on a lot of the mental load with regard to Households and and other work there, but but big picture is that especially at work and professionally, it's just keeping and going, keeping going, um, no matter what, and not necessarily taking the breaks or the pauses needed. Um, and I think honestly that where it is armored is that it sometimes is to my detriment, where perhaps the ultimate quality of what I'm doing may might not be as as great as I it could be if I could just stop for a little bit and then get back to it. Brene talks a lot in the book overall about, especially in group work, but in big picture circling back. And I think that is one thing that can be difficult in this context is when you're always going and there's always something to be done. Often there isn't the perceived time to circle back, but then also circling back requires some sort of, some sort of structure or means of doing that. And I think when we're involved in a lot of different things, sometimes we just have to go and keep moving forward. So, so indeed, that is one area that resonated with me that I would, I'd like to see if I could get more to the daring leadership side there, which is modeling and supporting rest, play, and recovery. And I would probably note too that I think my family would probably like that a lot. Well, the thing that pops into my head, I'm curious, how did you carve out time to read the book? And was that a challenge? You have a comment on yeah, that? I mean, honestly, it was one of those things that in this, this, well, let me, let me say this, you asked before about, um, or noted before about book clubs in general, and for, for years, I was part of one, um, okay. but I haven't participated in one in a long time, and partially that was the, the time, honestly, needed to devote to reading the books and things like that. This actually worked out perfect that I finished reading it this past weekend when I did have a little bit more time with the caveat being it's one of the only weekends in um in the in recent past where i actually worked most of the weekend because of a major work project we were working on so i had the least amount of rest available and yet i found this book was a good place to turn to to keep going and to to think through and frankly to help almost improve how we could even do some of this big big project work remotely where none of us are in the same place and having to work through things but you just make the time you just figure it out <laughs> Jeanette, did you have an, an armored, um, armored response that resonated with you? Yes, so uh, the one that Emma, I reflect what Emma says is, said as well. Um, I agreed everything with that. Um, but I also identified with, um, it was number nine, the hustling for your worth. So we live in this culture of busy and our work lives are no different. We're trying to um, have our hands, I am, always trying to have my hands in all these different things and committees and organizations through the university. And um, if you want to prove your worth, you have to, you almost feel like you have to have your hands in everything, right? Like you have to stay busy and you have to show why I'm worth it. Um, but through this book, I've been reevaluating my own strengths um, and clarifying my value within my organization um, so that I could really lean into my gifts and show my value through those strengths um, instead of jockeying for a position on somebody's spreadsheet of importance, so. Thank you. Yeah, it's, um, it, it's a challenge where I think there's a, a perception of if you're not busy, you're not doing your job. And it sounds like that's what you were addressing there. Um, but it's, it's, like you said, it's important to find out what your strengths are, be organized, and it, you don't have to be to be validated and valuable, you don't have to be running in 10 different directions. So that's interesting, Jeanette. Allison, do you have a, a comment on any of the armored, either one of that either Emma or Jeanette mentioned or a different one that resonated with you? So uh, anyone who knows me uh, would know that um, number 12, the armored leadership of rewarding exhaustion as a status symbol and attaching productivity to self-worth is probably tattooed on my body somewhere. Um, I'm over-programmed, I overwork, and uh, just a quick little story. 
Uh, every year um, at New Year's Eve, I pick a word or a phrase that I focus on for the year. And for the past three years, it has been to um, work life balance has been my phrase. Uh, I have not succeeded yet. Um, the pandemic has thrown a little wrench in my life, but it's getting better. Um, and then people would always tell me, you always say you're getting better at it, but I, I'm not. Um, so work-life balance is something that has become something that is my mantra, that I talk the talk to all of my colleagues, turn off the computer, go home, spend time with your family. Your children are only going to be young once. Um, go, you know, we work in a basement. If anyone knows where Lake Little Live is, we're underground. So we don't even get to see the daylight most of the time. Working from home has been a benefit. The silver lining is having windows. Um, so I need to do better at walking the walk uh, along with talking the talk. Um, I don't, there will be, I, on my deathbed, I'm not going to say, gee, I wish I worked harder. It's going to be, gee, I wish I spent time with the people who I love more. So it's something that really resonates and I work at. Um, it's hard for me to sit still. I multitask. I watch TV for laundry. I swift for the floor and watch TV, whatever. I'm always multitasking, talking a mile a minute. Uh, so um, I think it's important that I, I focus on that. Um, and then also one quick thing, I've been also um, creating a, cultivating a culture of belonging, inclusivity, and diverse um, perspectives. I think it's something that is very timely uh, and has been a very hot topic with a lot of organizations and I applaud that and I hope that we can all continue to work and bring that into our cultures and really um, strive to embrace and celebrate um, everyone's differences to make our places of work a better place. I think it's interesting that really all three panelists seem to feel this element of fatigue or, or tired and in, in trying to juggle multiple things. Uh, I, I'm curious, is it, is it a lot of activities? Is it staying up too late? Is it, I mean, because I think it's a common, I'm noticing Bill Damasio just posted sleep and play to live a life of meaning and contribution. Uh, I know uh, it is, is part of the goal to, I mean, you want to be strong personally to be, to be able to help other people, right? And some of that is wellness. Some of that is getting enough sleep. Some of that is um, uh, mental well-being. Some of that is physical well-being through exercise. I mean, there's lots of different elements of that. And I know the chamber had a, we had a presentation over at the Beck Center last year on, on work-life balance. I think we had about, I don't know if any of you were at that presentation over at the the Beck Center. Um, but I think that really is a topic that a lot of people are struggling with. And if you're not in a good spot, it can be difficult to, to help others. So I, I think that's, that's very interesting. Thank you all for sharing that. And I think it's interesting that there was some commonality there between all of the panelists. Um, I'd like to move on. So there was a page in the book, and I, I have a note here, it was page 189 that listed values. And it, there were probably, I don't know, maybe 80 or 90 values lift, listed on that page. And when I got to that section in the book, I can remember I was at home and I went to my kids and talked to them about values. I went to my wife and talked to them about values. And I showed them the page and we had a discussion about what we value. Um, so that was kind of an interesting little test case at home, but I'd like to get your input on, on what if you could name one or two values, either something that was listed on that page. And I think just the exercise of trying to evaluate what you value is, is really meaningful. So uh, we'll start with, um, with Jeanette this time, and then we'll go to Allison and Emma. But why don't you, if, if you wouldn't mind sharing a couple of one or two values that you picked out in going through this book and how you might incorporate that into your life. Sure. Uh, so I actually do this. Uh, I teach a senior level social work course called Human Behavior in the Social Environment. And I do this exercise with my students. I give them a list, not quite this list, although I might incorporate this list. Sure. Sure. And I ask them to do the same thing uh, down to like their top three. And okay. um, it is always incredibly difficult. I try to do it with them. 
Um, but my uh, top two values are actually the same as Brené Brown's that she mentions in the book, which are courage and faith. Um, and she mentions choosing faith and courage over comfort in the world. Um, so for me, that means in academia, I am advocating for my students in what they need um, a lot of times. And I need to be brave enough, have the courage uh, to say no to people or, or ideas that compromise my values. Um, and another thing that she says in the book is uh, um, that, as she said, if I miss the boat, it wasn't my boat. I need to have faith in that missed opportunity. The fact that I said no, um, that that wasn't my opportunity. So. Sure, sure. Yeah. Well, thank you for sharing that. Yeah, I think there's, that also gets into sometimes this feeling of missing out or missed opportunities and you, you need to have that faith and that something else is coming down the road that might be a, a better, more important opportunity. Sure. Uh, Allison, would you like to share a value or two that, that in going through the book you found important to you and how that, that impacts your, your life? Sure. So um, I just want to start by saying <clears throat> I work with clients on a daily basis. Most of them are low moderate income living in situations that I can never, ever understand or imagine. So um, my two that I picked out are uh, gratitude and commitment. So commitment probably goes back to that previous conversation where I over I work all the time and I never sit down because uh, the motto at Lakewood Alive is we never say no. Uh, so it's always, uh, I don't have the answer for you, but I'm going to find it, or I don't have the resource for you, but I will find it. Uh, and so I believe, um, and I also say people, 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 we deal with people. So if someone doesn't pick up this heavy lift, no one else is going to, and a person is going to suffer. So we try very hard to find a, a, a resolution to the problem. So commitment is something that has always been uh, ingrained in me from a very early age and has really benefited me through my professional career. Uh, and then gratitude. Um, I read some quote once that said, um, I hope that your list of things that you're grateful for is longer than your list of wants. Uh, and so I've really always lived by that. I am so thankful for everything. I'm thankful to have the job that I have. Uh, I'm thankful to be able to help my neighbors. Uh, and I'm thankful to work with the people that I work with. And so I really try to keep that into perspective because uh, my job sometimes is very difficult, uh, in, especially with the situations that I see. And so to emotionally handle that, um, I try to just remain positive and stay grateful for all the things that I do have in my life. So my two are... Uh, commitment and gratitude, but I, you know, there's a million on here, and I think it's a wonderful, Jeanette, that exercise that you do with your students. Uh, I think we might be doing it at a staff meeting coming up here at Lake Little Life. Sorry, guys, if you're listening, uh, but um, I think it'll be a good exercise for us to do um, and really to get to know the inside of everyone more so than we probably already do. Yeah, I think if we could take from this book and, and reach out to groups or teams that we're involved with, to try to have some of these more meaningful conversations, then it will be worth all of our time probably for having read this book. Uh, a quick follow-up, Allison. So the motto, I saw the motto of, uh, we never say no. What, how, does, how do you think that, that, when you said that, my immediate response was, I don't know how that plays. Like, do, are, having read the book, has that changed your perception of that? Do you think it's, what do you think of that motto, if you don't mind me? <laughs> Clarify so more, more. it's a flaw. It's a flaw. It is a flaw. Uh, my husband tells me it's a flaw and that I need to mind my business and say no more. Uh, but it is, uh, we, oftentimes people get referred to us because people don't know the answer. So if you call City Hall, I'll call Lakewood Alive, they'll help you. Call, I don't know, a business, Lakewood Alive will help you. Uh, and I, we want to be able to be that resource, that go-to resource for people. So I, it is not sustainable. It is not a good practice. Again, I'm talking the talk. Do not do this at home. But I'm walking the walk of this is what I do. Um, yeah. Until I come up with a better solution. Uh, and we have hired more people. When I first started at Lakewood Alive, there was only um, three and a half people, and now we're up to seven. So we are able to delegate, which is important and support and come together when we need to, to never say no uh, and to make it more of a uh, successful model uh, and more sustainable. 
Sure. But don't do that at home. Never say no is not anything well, that I encourage. I think a clarification could be we can find out the right answer and it might not be Lakewood Alive. Absolutely. Oh, yeah. And it's, it's, yeah. it's not always Lakewood Alive. But we never say, sorry, we can't help you. Uh, sure. So maybe it's, sorry, we, we, of course we'll help you, uh, instead of we never say no. Sure. Um, Patty, just to let you know, we are getting a, I'm noticing on the comments, a call out for maybe a Jeanette sharing some of the value information. And um, so maybe we'll circle back on that, Jeanette, and, and try to post that. I think that, I think a lot of people would love to share this value exercise with other people. So any resources you have there that you might be able to share with Patty so that she could distribute to the, to the uh, participants in this conference call, that would be great. Sure, I can forward that to Patty tomorrow, so. Thank you very much. Emma, would you mind talking a little bit about your values? And then we're, we're getting towards the end of the panel discussion and I have a couple of other questions that I can go to, but before Emma goes uh, forward to talk about her values, if anybody else has any questions, they would like to throw out for the last uh, 10 minutes or so of discussion. Now would be a good time to do that. And then if Emma, if you could talk a little bit about your core values, that would be great as well. Thanks. So um, I loved all these words and it was so difficult going through the list because I kept saying, oh wait, that one and that one. And I ultimately narrowed it down to 20 and then got down to five. But then <laughs> in reading her, her work, I mean, she did say, that ultimately there might be some words that almost build to the core of the word or, or you know, that thing. So my, the ones I narrowed down to for my last two were um, curiosity and connection. And the connection really mattered to me because of among my top five were community and service. But I felt like connection actually is what my core value is as far as trying to make things uh, better and it's making connections between people communities uh, it's it's heck it might even just be making sure somebody knows somebody else um, but but making sure that information is ultimately moving in the right direction so that we can evoke positive change um, in our homes in Lakewood and and beyond and in our communities beyond so that was that's why connection was mine and then curiosity was the other big one and I think that for better or worse, she talked a lot about it in the prior chapter. And so I think it was really like top of mind, but ultimately uh, it is because I'm always, always wanna know more about everything. Um, now that might be a flaw to some degree where if I'm curious about you as a person, I may be asking a lot of questions and I know for some people that's, that's not comfortable, ergo I need to work on that. But at the same time, it's because I have this yearning to learn more from other people, um, uh, reading the newspaper, uh, just reading articles about stuff that is relevant for my work and my world, um, as well as those that are just interesting. And so I think curiosity uh, as, a, as a core element is what, is what I have that then enables me um, to do things like working with different groups or meeting new people and maybe feeling afraid on the inside, but on the outside, being able to talk to people and interact and engage and things like that. So, so those are my, my top two. And I liked that they were both C's. It was very. Yeah, that's nice. <laughs> well, as a follow up, we're also getting a question in the chat. So now that you've gone through the ex exercise of identifying the values, do you think you will uh, incorporate that and, and discuss that with other people? and other team members so that people are aware that that's where you're coming from? Like, how do you then take those values and put it into your life? Is it through communicating that with other people or just being more top of mind about it? Anybody that wants to jump in on that? Uh, so I'll jump in. Um, I think my coworkers know about my commitment um, and perhaps it's a flaw at times because uh, I'm really pushing people hard uh, to strive for better so that we can work to improve the quality of life of our clients. So we really need to do our research, be very well versed on the programs that are available so that we can steer people in the right direction. Because again, we're dealing with people and it's not just a pothole in the street. It's, it's a person and if we don't intervene, they may not have a better or improved quality of life. So I think I do 
uh, incorporate these things. Um, gratitude, I try to express to all of my coworkers plus the people in my life how much I appreciate them. Uh, probably overly, I really love writing notes. I like to mail notes to people, um, especially during the pandemic. Um, Nobody people are like, oh. anymore, Allison. Nobody does that. Kudos. I know. I write thank you notes for getting thank you notes. I just really like to send notes. Um, but I, um, so I would say to Emma's point, it, I might have a flaw in my commitment just because I may push a little too hard for perfection, again, ultimately to improve our clients' lives. Anyone else, do you think you're more likely to now discuss with other people, either Jeanette or Emma, what your, what, so what your values are so maybe they know where, where you're coming from as you have conversations? Yeah, I mean, honestly, what comes to mind in, in doing this exercise is how curious I am about what other people's core values are. So what I think about it is that what I'd like, whether or not I use this list from her book, but it, it did make me think about in my department meetings or on my one-on-ones with my employees to talk about this a little more because we tend to talk about, we do talk about some personal things, you know, the, the context. So we're not robots or anything like that, but then otherwise we're talking about work. But some of these philosophical concepts um, these values are something that I am absolutely now curious about, about some of the people I work closely with, because if they can identify some for me, if they're willing, of course, that would actually help me communicate with them better and figure out where those pinch points, those other things that are more meaningful for them. So I think, I think that's what comes to mind is I'd like to know more about other people's core values. Sure. Jeanette, any comment or should, can we move on or? Um, yeah, real quick. Uh, I agree with what Emma was saying about how I am more curious now about other people's values. Um, but going to the one question about, um, I feel like if I am living my values uh, of what they truly are being faith and courage that will be demonstrated through my leadership, you'll see a lot of the others in the list. You'll see integrity, you'll see caring, you'll see connectedness and all of those other things will fall into place if I'm living my values. So, yeah. Um, we've had a couple of questions. Um, once again, wanting to circle back maybe as we close up to the pandemic. And then also uh, fear. So I think really the core of the book, in my opinion, is about vulnerability. And, and it can be difficult to, um, to open up to people. Just doing that can be can create anxiety and fear. And, and I'm curious if any of you have a comment about how your own fears might play into your leadership. And, and also, uh, we had a, um, my office is in Lakewood and there's five of us here and everyone's been working remotely, but we did do a, uh, a staff meeting uh, where we, we stayed apart by 12 feet and had masks on, but I want to let them know as people begin, as we start opening up, I have this fear of causing potentially harm as we start to come together again and just sharing that with them and letting them all know that if they have any concerns, they need to bring it up to me, that there's going to be no judgment here, that I want to do things for my small business in a manner that makes everyone feel safe. I mean, there's certain protocols I'm putting into place, but I just wanted to have a short meeting to say, I'm not sure what the right answer is. I don't have all the answers. And I'm worried that I might do something that isn't the, in retrospect, 2020 hindsight, isn't the right thing to do. But I think sharing that with them is giving them confidence in knowing that, you know, even though we might not all have the answers, we're going to do our best. Do, do what we can and try our hardest. And, and that's really all I wanted to, to portray when we, hit, when we had that short meeting on, on Tuesday. Um, so anyone else would, can talk a little bit about your own fears and, and how that, that plays into maybe your leadership style? Or anyone have any comments on that? Uh, Mike, I just have to echo the fear that we have uh, with opening back up Lakewood Live. Uh, we now are in an office space that would allow us to open back up. Uh, we have offices for everyone, so everyone would have their own private space. Uh, but again, just want to be open and honest and address people's concerns and their fears. So we tried to make it as 
uh, democratic a process as possible and encourage people to either come to us one on one or as a group in our staff meetings to talk about their fears. So we're trying to address those. So totally on, I wish I had a crystal ball um, that would tell me I'm making right choices, but it, it is scary because people's lives are at stake. Sure. I mean, I consider myself an optimist, but I think you need a certain amount of realism. There's, there was a, a part of the book, Bill Damasio makes reference to it, the Stockdale Paradox, when he was a prisoner of war, and talks about the people that had the most difficulty with it were the people that were just blind to the issues that they might be there for a while. And, oh, we're going to get rescued in a week. We're going to get rescued in a month. And that being that eternal optimist sometimes makes it more difficult to have success and you need a certain amount of realism um, with what's going on right now and, and just being upfront. So, um, so thank you for sharing that, Allison, about Lakewood Live. Jeanette, did you have a comment about? Uh, yeah, real quick. Um, so we had talked earlier about the, uh, I'll call it the stormy first draft in the latter part of the book. Sure, um, sure. She calls it something else as well. But, um, and she talks about the story that she tells herself. And I thought that this played along with the fears that we might find in leadership because we're telling ourselves a false story or we already have this preconceived notion on what somebody else thinks. And I think that it's really important to identify that to debunk that fear and get rid of it. Um, so I think that part of the book was probably one of my favorites actually, so. Sure, yeah, that a lot of times we, what we think isn't reality. Would that be a fair comment, Jeanette? And, but if you don't say it out loud or share it, it's difficult to be a mind reader as well. Isn't that the case? Right, yeah. When she talks about uh, the, the story I'm telling myself, like, uh, so I can go up to my coworker and say, well, the story that I'm telling myself about the situation is that you feel or that I feel and this is happening. And like you said, a lot of times it's not even anything about that. Maybe your coworker's just having an awful day or they didn't get sleep or anything like that. It has nothing to do with you, uh, but you internalize it like it does, so. Sure. If I could just add with the, actually combining the, the fears and the, the Stockdale paradox overall, I think one thing I have absolutely appreciated through this pandemic in my workplace is how the communication between our senior leaders and leadership team and staff has been consistent the whole time. I'm, I'm, there's about 150 of us that work for my nonprofit. Wow. And okay. so there's a couple of things happening. One is that leadership took things seriously and immediately started working and working through some decisions, but didn't make those in isolation. They included other voices and ideas on how it could work, but then immediately communicated information out to everybody so that there could be feedback and moving forward because honestly, as we've all experienced every day or at least every week has been very different with this and how, how we react. So with regard to the Stockdale paradox too, I think having those different voices is so critical. And she talks a lot about this teamwork and listening is that because we all come at problems and situations from a different, not only a different frame of mind, but those values and those other things that are guiding us really really show you know really show themselves especially in crisis and problems but by taking the time to hear from everybody and then coalescing what's being said and and, and then again circling back I, i'm not a huge fan of that term but i get it um and checking back in has been so helpful so so where we've been we've had we are now in phase two of our reopen we we stayed open the whole time as an essential organization um but at the same time has have, have acted in a couple different ways that are meeting the needs of the operation, but most importantly, meeting the needs of the employees and what's safe and what's appropriate. And so, um, so I think using those sorts of techniques that she has in this book, I think is important. And it speaks to the fact that even if we are in a pandemic, um, we have to make some decisions quickly, but there are some really positive ways we can make those decisions that still bring more people along versus really top down and not listening to the situation, which makes people even more afraid, honestly, in things mm -hmm. like this. Yeah. Uh, well, we want to be respectful of everyone's time. I know we do have a door prize, so we certainly appreciate, I think we still have over 20 participants logged online. Um, it's been quite a few years since the Chamber of Commerce has done a business book read. So I certainly hope that everyone that logged on today uh, found a benefit in this and appreciated it. Feel free to throw any comments on the chat. We'll keep it open for another five minutes or so. Uh, to give us feedback. 
on if you enjoyed participating in the book read, if you have any suggestions for maybe another book, if we would maybe even consider doing this on an annual basis. Uh, so feel free to add that to the chat at this point. And then for those of you still online, um, we do have a, uh, a door prize. It's a, I think Patty, oh, there it is. It's a GV Art Community T-shirt. I don't know, Patty, do you, can you log in and talk a little bit about it? Is that available? Or do you want me to, if you could do it, that'd be great. I think you have your mute on, Patty, but would you mind? Hi, everybody, can you hear me? Yep. Uh, yes, yeah, so uh, our door prize is courtesy of GB Art. As many of you might know, they are doing a community fundraiser with this cool Lakewood community t-shirt. Um, a portion of the proceeds from each shirt they sell will be donated to Lakewood Community Service Center. They reached out to the chamber last month um, and wanted to give back to the community uh, that raised them. And uh, we thought it was a great idea. Uh, one of the things that we know is Lakewood, having such a huge hospitality industry and a service sector, has really been hit hard with unemployment um, uh, due to the pandemic. So there's been a big spike at Lakewood Community Service Center. Um, they're they act as our food pantry or food bank for our community. And um, th uh, the money will be used to uh, purchase uh, protein and fresh produce uh, right. for liquid families. So- A random um, number generator. I have the winner here from a random number generator. It is Elena Faith. So what should Elena do? Should she email you, Patty, or do you want to email her? You know, either way, if I don't get an email from Elena, I'll reach out in the morning. I just need to know your t-shirt size. And since GV Art store is still closed uh, um, and they don't plan to reopen until second week of June, they said, they'll ship it to you. So again, um, I've got your email too. So we'll connect and I'll give you that t-shirt. And thank you so much for registering for the webinar. And just in closing, we got done at 8.01. So that, I think that's pretty good in terms of keeping it on time. And a final shout out to, uh, to the Lakewood Public Library too for ordering extra copies of the book so that our community could read it. And, and I would think maybe, did we record this? I think Patty. Um, so maybe even um, a push out to our membership if they wanna get the book and read it, hopefully we'll see increased demand uh, for the book, but thank you very much to the Lakewood Public Library and Andrea Fisher, who's on our uh, Chamber Education Task Force as well for ordering extra copies of the book. We really appreciate their support as well. And I think that's it, everyone. Thank you. Have a good night and goodbye. Bye, everybody. Thanks to the panelists. Good job, everyone. Good, night. good job. Thank you. Good night. That was fun. <laughs>